I can't see you, but I hear you. <laughs> uh, can we all stand? We're going to worship Jesus. Because he's awesome.
God of victory. The enemy may be all around me, but I'm running free because you set me free. The enemy may be all around me, but I'm running free because you set me free. Father, we come to you today just thanking you for the breath in our, in our lungs, the air we breathe, the sunshine. All these things are proof that you love us. Every day, we can only thank you with our lives, with the way we live our lives. Lord, please change us. Make us look more like you. Help us to fearlessly answer your call.
Praise God, yes. This is like one of my favorite, favorite verses, and I don't know the number, but it's from Psalms, and um, our scripture tells us that God will make you lie down in green, pa green pastures. It's like, wow, God, like, you have to make me, make me, that we don't know even to rest. God has to tell us to rest, and if you don't listen to the Spirit, he's going to make you listen. <laughs> so I just wanted to um, just share that with you guys. I feel like some of us just um, feel like we're stuck in the grind. <clears throat> and that's me. I mean, I'm speaking from my own heart. So we're going to ask God now to lead us and so that we can listen to him. This is my worship, this is my offering, in every moment, I withhold nothing, I'm learning to trust you, even when I can't see it, and even in suffering, I have to believe it. If you say it's wrong, then I'll say no. If you say release, I'm letting go. If you're in it with me, I'll begin. When you say to jump, I'm diving in. If you say be still, then I will wait. If you say to trust, I will obey. I don't want to follow my own ways. I'm done chasing feelings. like a burden, but once I could grasp it, you took me further, further than I was asking, and simply to see you, it's worth it all. trust I will obey. Teach me how to follow in your way. I'm done chasing feelings. Spirit lead me. Yes. God, huh. so many questions. So many things that we have questions about that we're not sure, you know but you're such a good father. You always give us what we ask for. Always give us exactly what we need, even when we, we don't know. Come on now, when all hope is gone. When all hope is gone, and your word is all I've got, I have to believe. You still bring water from the rock to satisfy my thirst, to love me at my worst. And even when I don't remember, you remind me of my worth. I don't trust my ways. I'm trading in my thoughts. Cause you're all that I want I bend it on my knees This is the love you have for me And even when it don't make sense Gonna let you fear it leave Go 
God. Hey, good morning, everybody. You can take a seat. Hey, now I can see you. I love that. Awesome. Good morning, Rock Church. My name is Bethany. I'm the outreach pastor here at The Rock. And if you haven't met me before, you should know I'm pretty silly, crazy. Usually I'm smiling most of the time. <laughs> Most of the time. Hey, our mission here at The Rock Church is helping families changing lives. All right, so I need a little, we're going to have to do some work on this. So I'm going to say helping families, and you're going to say changing lives, okay? Our mission here at The Rock is helping families changing lives. Wow, that was awesome. You guys got that on the first try. So next week, when I say it again, you got it, right? <laughs> Helping families, yes. changing lives. Yes, because we have to do that together. Pastor Terry and I can't do that. We all do that. We are the church. We are the body of Christ, and we work together to help families and change lives. Part of that for us is going into Kennedy Park in Vandergrift, which is an awesome, a lot of fun. We had a great week last week. We did. I was trying to think of some of the, the families that we reached out to last week. We had some new families come. We had families that showed up that we hadn't seen like for two years, and they were like, hey, do you remember us? There was this one little boy that talked yes. to Pastor Terry who was like, do you remember me? I came and climbed this rock wall last time you were here. Yes, and he Two told years me, ago. He told me I called him Fitch, and I'm like, okay, Fitch Meister, climb it again. Because <laughs> I didn't even remember the kid, but they remember us, so that's kind of cool and kind of good. That is amazing. It's so, it's so cool to see God work in that way in that little boy's life. And he was all by himself, right? He was. And he, he stayed with us the entire time. And at the end, he was like, hey, could I make snow cones? And I said, how about next time? We'll start you at the very beginning, and I'll train you on how to make the snow cones, and then you can be one of our helpers. And he's like, okay. <laughs> By the way, he's eight years old. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that cool when eight-year-olds want to sit there and help us out and do that kind of stuff? Yes. That's really awesome. But making snow cones is a really fun job, isn't it? Yeah. It well, is. It's I think throwing the ice is a really fun job. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Pastor Terry prefers to throw the ice as to eat it. Dump it down your shirt. He likes to do that, too. Uh -huh. <laughs> we have a great time when we're doing outreach. So next Sunday, if you want to join us, we would love to have you join us. If I could get the giving slide, that would be awesome. So if you are visiting with us today, I would love it if you would go to our website, which is yourrock.org, and fill out that little form that says, I'm new and we will absolutely reward you with donuts, okay? So free donuts when you fill out the form. And if you don't do it on your own, then I might chase you down <laughs> because I love you and I want to connect with you. Um, also, if you would like to give, you can do that on our website at that little blue giving circle. You can put cash or checks or 
coins or whatever you want in the green boxes that are on the walls. One's right here in the hallway and one's out at the Welcome Center. So that's how you give. And giving makes God happy. (laughs) He smiles. It's one of his commands. It's one of the things that he says to do is to give generously from a cheerful heart what he has called you to do. And he always gives back. It's it's pretty cool. Yeah. Pretty awesome. Yeah, we had a chance yesterday that Beth and I went and gave yeah. somewhere that we didn't get anywhere back. I mean, we don't get anything back, but it's kind of cool. We went in to the a, kingdom. In the kingdom, yes. <laughs> we went to a church that is has a whopping attendance between 17 and 20. It used to run 300, and they're all getting older. And we got the chance to sit there and try to coax them on how to reach people and how to grab people. And we went into a, I guess. Project a na- a neighborhood type neighborhood type kind of place. Like Sandalwood, if you yeah. live around here. We went in there like and that. we got to meet people and, and got to try to show them that, you know, you don't hide behind your church, but you go out where people are. And we were giving them ideas how to do it. And I think we're going back and we're going to take a bounce house and we're going to try to get them to do that. We, we talked about them, how they need to change their church and things. And some were receptive and some were like, eh, I'm not too sure about you guys. <laughs> but, you know, I'm not too sure about myself some days either. So it's all good. But yeah, we got the chance to do that yesterday. That was kind of cool. And it's there about were giving. About, about 12 families that we did get to yes. connect with. We were doing bicycle repairs and giving away bicycles to the kids there. So it was actually really cool. I really I had, I had a great time. It was fun. I enjoyed it. I don't know about you. I like touching other people, not just where we're at. And that's what the Bible refers to when it says giving alms. It's not just going to benefit us, but it's going to benefit God's kingdom. We may never see the results of that, but that's okay because it's giving. And that's what we want to be as a people that are give. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but... No, we're good. Cool. It, it flows. It flows? Yeah. So one of the things that we often do to help fund our outreach is make pizzas on Friday night. Yes. But we're not making any pizzas this Friday, just so you know. Yes. <laughs> Next week, we'll try again. We'll let you know. We're giving you a break yes. from pizza, just to let you know. Nobody really needs a break from pizza. That's but. true. I could eat pizza quite a bit. But Ray no one, eats no pizza one's every day. Be Where's Ray? There's Ray. <laughs> Ray's like, I like pizza. <laughs> <laughs> And Todd is doing awesome with the pizza, too, by the way. I hope you're loving it. If you haven't tried it yet, you absolutely should. Next Friday, not this Friday. Next Friday, Friday. not this Friday. Yes, next Friday. All right. All right, so we got another slide here. I need my slides. (gasps) Oh, not that one. I want the one ahead of that one. There should be one above that. Is there one above that one? There's one I want. I wanted to talk a little bit about COVID-19. I don't know how many of you heard this week that our White House has re-implicated or reinstated masks for everybody. Just to let you know, we don't do masks unless you want to do a mask, but if you want to do a mask, you can do a mask. Just to let you know that, all right? Just to let everyone know. Um, I don't know if anyone follows that or not. It's totally your choice. Um, I did want to say some things because I did some research this week, and I just want to inform you. How many heard about the Delta variant that is going all through America? And everyone's heard that, you know, you're supposed, there's supposed to be a lot of it. I don't know if you know this or not. I actually went online yesterday, and I'm like, okay, so how do they determine that? They really don't. It takes a 20-day test to figure out whether you have the Delta variant or not. So all they're doing is sampling. So we don't really know what's going on. So don't panic because one more time they're trying to make everyone afraid. Just live life. That's my encouragement to you. Just live it. If you get it, you'll get through it. If you don't, get to go to heaven. All right? So how's that? Make sure you're ready to go to heaven. And seriously, if, if you're afraid of it, get a vaccine. And some of I know are anti-vacciners. And just let you know, and I wasn't... I wasn't planning on saying this, but I actually got the vaccine, and the reason I got the vaccine is because doing outreach and stuff, I told my wife that I kind of felt like, you know, that some people would be like, I can't talk to you, and I wanted to say, I'm vaccinated, don't worry about it, so if that bothers you, I'm vaccinated, I'm still semi-normal, it only (laughs) changed me a little bit, so... And seriously, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling is what I'm trying to say. If you're afraid, get a vaccine. If you're not afraid, don't worry about it. Uh, I did see it was really cool on Facebook this week that, you know, they used to have little circles around you say, I've been vaccinated. How many saw that? They actually had one this week that I saw and it was really cool. It says, I eat nutritious. I take vitamin D. I take vitamin C. I take zinc and I eat healthy. And I'm like, that's what we need to start doing. But God's good. So just let you know, we... We're not going to start a mask mandate. That is totally up to you. Uh, By the HIPAA laws, I'm really not allowed to ask you any of those questions. So we're just going to live life. Is everyone good with that? We're just going to live and let live. Praise God. And we are still going to open our fun center October 2nd. I I was looking. Today is August 1st. That is two months away. Woohoo! How cool is that? 
so what we're going to be doing soon is we're going to be building teams to staff the fun center. And if you've never done that, how many were here when we did family fun night and worked family fun night? Yeah, not very many people anymore, so you don't remember family fun night. If you've never done it, it's better than outreach because they're here and they're trapped. It's like they have nowhere to go. Like you can just follow them around because it's not like the park where they can wander off and hide. It's really cool and it's really awesome though, seriously. It is a really good time just to, to love on people and we're going to be doing some things. We're going to be doing some training for that because if you want to work the climbing area, we have to teach you how things work. And if you're going to do um, a laser tag, you're going to have to learn how that works and all that kind of stuff. And we're going to have a lot of things that we're going to need people to do. We're, like I said, we're still buying more video games, which is going to be awesome and cool. And we'll need people in the pizza shop, yes. the donut shop, doing that that end of it too. So it's going to be fun. Yeah. We're going to have a good time. We're going to be giving to our community one more time and letting them know that Jesus loves them and thinks they're amazing. Yes. And giving families something to do. How many yes. know there's not a lot for families to do around here unless you drive to Monroeville or you drive to Greensburg or you drive to Butler or you drive to Pittsburgh. So we're going to try our very hardest and we're going to do well at meeting that need. So I just want to let you know that. That's all I have for announcements. Thanks for helping me out. God's good all the time and all the time God's good. Really good to see you this morning. Um, sorry for any confusion on the sound this morning, and I had hums, and I was trying to figure out. I've learned something. The worship team likes to trade microphones, and I don't know if you all know that or not, but yes, we need to make sure you have your own microphone all the time, so it's all good, because Ray and I are, like, confused, and I'm like, where are they? He's like, I don't know. They play musical microphones, so we play musical microphones this morning, but God's good. We are going to do something in the near, very near future. We're going to do a fundraiser to help upgrade the equipment up here again. How many enjoy the worship team? Praise God. I enjoy the worship team, and I want to give them better tools. Our drums are like, I was sitting there, and, and uh, yeah, sorry, names get out of me. John walked up to me, I almost said Joe, but John walked up to me and said the drums are starting to die, and I'm like, well, let's see, when did we get those drums? I think they're probably about 10 years old. So our drums are dying, so we need some new drums, we need to improve our speaker system, so we'll be talking about that a little bit later, so get ready to give. Because given it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. So I want to get into the Word of God this morning, and, and I've been talking about why the church doesn't have power, and I want to start moving into the power we've had, and as I started thinking about this week and praying about it, and after I got my roof on, my roof is now dry, it's finished, it's like all done, and it doesn't leak anymore. I've been waiting for it to rain, and you know it hasn't rained? I'm like, I want to see it run off the roof instead of into the house. And I'm like really impressed. And it hasn't rained since then, but it's been really good. We got the roof on. I think I lost like probably seven pounds sweating to death on the roof when it was the metal's hot and the roof's hot and you're up there sweating and you're baking, but God's good. I'm well done. It's now shake and bake, so I'm good. But praise God. But I wanted to get into this morning and kind of backtrack a little bit and, and try to go back and let you understand where the power of God is and how much of a difference we can make into the world. You know, yesterday as we worked with the church that my brother is actually preaching at, he's not pastor, but he's preaching, he's interim pastor, or interim preacher, I guess you would say there, I got a really good chance to talk to people, and, and it was really interesting because one of the ladies who was there was 87 years old. Now, I don't know about you, that's getting up there, seriously, but she was still going well, and she looked at me, and I'm like, I'd never guessed you're 87. She says, I swim every day, I exercise every day, and I eat healthy, and I thought, there you go, you got this, and as I was talking to her, we were talking about how the church has changed, because her husband was actually a pastor at one time in the denomination thereof, and we were talking about how that over 20 years the church has transformed, and how that over recent times the church and the world is really changing quickly. I don't know if you know that or not, but it's not the same. And, and, and talking to these people as I talked to them yesterday, it was really interesting of our perception of what we used to think church was and what we need church to become. And I want to tell you, the greatest thing we can become is powerful people walking in the power of God. The greatest thing we can become is people that are sold out to God and saying, God, not my will, but your will be done. And that's what Jesus prayed on the cross. Everyone knows that, right? And he also told all of us that we were to take up our cross and follow him. Now, the cross is not something that we just wear around our neck, even though I thank God that I wear one around my neck just to remind me of whose I am every once in a while and just thank God for it. But the cross is really a weapon of torture and death. 
is really what it's all about. And that's me putting myself on the cross with Jesus saying, not your will, Father, but my will be done. And being willing to let my old man be crucified. And my old man is that, that physical side of me that, that has all the wants and all the needs and all that stuff. And I always want to be and want all this kind of things. But I, I don't like to be spiritual. How many know being spiritual is hard? How many know that, right? It, it's hard whenever like God calls you and says, why don't you fast for a while? And you're like, I'm hungry. And it, how many have ever done that kind of stuff? Or someone pulls out in front of them, you and you're like having a bad day already and you want to lay on the horn and tell them they're number one and all those kind of things and you have to sit there and smile. Or maybe you do it in front of someone else by accident, you don't see them and they tell you you're number one and you just kind of want to wave and say, hi, I love you, Jesus loves you and thinks you're amazing, you know, and all that kind of stuff. But being a child of God is not easy. I remember I was talking to somebody one time, and they're like, well, you Christians are just weak because you use Jesus as a crutch. And I said, did you ever try walking this road? Did you ever try walking away from things that you enjoyed? You know, I want to tell you something. When I was a kid, they grew up and they told me how terrible sin was. When I hit 18 and 19, I found something out. You know what I found out, Garrett? It was fun. So if anyone tells you sin isn't fun, they're lying to you because it's fun for a season. You know, it is fun. It, it's fun whenever I started dating and, you know, staying up till 2 o'clock in the morning and running around and all that kind of stuff and, and doing things that my mom and dad didn't know about. It's like you get one up on them even though later on they find out somehow, usually because you tell them, and all that kind of stuff. But sin is fun, but the problem is with sin is it's like a credit card. How many ever got your first credit card and abused it? Yeah. Some means don't want to admit to that, but I remember when I got my first credit card, it was so easy to put it there and just charge something and say, I'll pay for that later, I'll pay for it next week whenever I get paid and it won't be a problem. And about that time, your water pump dies in your car, yeah, or your battery goes bad and suddenly now what you thought you were going to pay for next week, now you have to pay for this this week. And before long, if you've never done this, I'm proud of you, but I've done it. Suddenly, your credit card bill gets so big that you're like, how did we get here? And how many remember your first credit card that it was like 28.99% interest? Then like if you miss one payment, they add like $15 to it. And, you know, you sit there and the interest drives you crazy. And I remember sitting there going, this is crazy. And that's kind of what sin is really like when we walk in our own ways. It's fun, but it's so easy to build that account bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and the interest starts coming in until we come to the place that we can't pay the debt anymore. And that's where Jesus steps in and says, I'll pay the debt for you. Yeah. But just because he paid the debt, it doesn't mean I can go back and recharge. When he pays my debt, that means I got your debt. Now let's be smarter than you were last time. Now, all of us get stupid sometimes, right? We all know that, and we all forget sometimes. But that's what Jesus came for, and that is why we as children of God need the hope of the gospel to tell a world that is in debt, that is ready to go bankrupt because of all the sin in their life, that there is a Savior that what? Washes that sin away and cleanses that sin away and tears up your bill and says, I covered it at the cross of Calvary and I'll adopt you into my family and I will supply all your need according to the riches of glory. That's what the gospel's all about. It's a gospel of hope. It's a gospel of joy. And in order to do that, we need something. We need the power of God moving in us that we are a billboard, a testimony, a witness of God's greatness and not just a testimony and a witness of religion. As I was talking to those people yesterday, I had to talk them through the religious things in their life and, and how their church was designed and all those things. And I, I got an opportunity to talk to them and say, we had to do things in my life. And I said, I had to do things in my life. And I said, not everyone likes it when you change to love on people, but how many know we've got to change to love on people? What am I talking about? I'm talking about if you just got, as they say in religious world, if you got saved and you now have bought life insurance that you're going to go to heaven, that's not what this is all about. Jesus didn't call you to get saved for life insurance. Jesus called you to follow him so that your life would be changed so that then you can have other people follow you and find Jesus Christ. It's not about being saved so that we're inoculated or vaccinated that someday when we die we're going to get to heaven, but it's so that we can experience the fullness of God. 
and we can experience who he is, that we can become a family together and love on Jesus together and love on the Father together and have the Holy Spirit move in us and use us for his glory and his honor so that other people get convinced that there is a way. And Jesus called it the way. He said, I am the way. And that's really what this is all about. So as I got into this and I began to look at this, I said, why is the church so powerless? And I said, it's not. It's the people that are powerless. You see, God has paid for all the prices in all of our lives to have power. It's just a matter of whether or not we want to plug into the power. When you plug into the power... How many, well, maybe you've never done this. I've wired houses in my lifetime. I, I wired and built houses and wired them. And every once in a while, when you turn the circuit on the first time, it pops. Don't know if you've ever done that or not. But that means, not that the breaker's bad, but there's something wrong in the circuit. So if you come to God and you sit there and say, I want the power, and you hit the switch and it pops back off, it doesn't mean God's broken. It means you're broken. It means there's something in my life that is causing a short circuit in my life that's robbing me of the power of God. And then I've got to go to God and say, God, examine me. Because when a breaker pops, you don't just sit there and cut the wires and say, we don't need that. How many know what I'm talking about? You've got to sit there and say, every circuit in this house is for a purpose. And when I wired that house, every room had power and everything was of a purpose because it was needed there. And we've got to realize when that breaker pops that it's going to cause a dead spot in the house, right? Everyone got that and understand that? You know, if you have a bad circuit and your circuit keeps popping, there's something wrong in the house and you need it there. That means there's something somewhere that is broken, so we've got to look in our lives when we go to turn the power on and there is no power and we say it's powerless and no power comes on. We've got to sit there and say something's broken inside of me. Now that takes, listen, it's really cool to talk to some church yesterday and look at their church, but what about us? We can get proud and say, well, we're different and we're growing and people are coming and all those kind of things. We're doing outreach. But we've got to be careful in our own personal lives that when we hit the switch that the power comes on. How many know there's something wrong? How many ever walk in your house and you turn the light switch on and the light doesn't work? How many know that's an issue? How many know something's wrong? Now, what's the first thing you do is you change the light bulb, right? How many know if the light bulb doesn't go on, what's wrong? There's something bigger wrong. You see, Jesus said to you and I that we are the light of the world. Now, if our light's not shining, one of two things is wrong. Either our light bulb burn out, yeah, and that can happen in our lives. You know, the greatest way a light bulb gets burnt out is, I remember back in the day when I used to work on cars with my dad, and we used to have light bulbs, and anyone remember that? Now we got LED headlights, and it's really kind of awesome and all these. But we used, my dad used to have one, just a bulb in this, I don't know, Yeah, extension cord that was there. You hung it all around. And if you dropped it, how many know what happened to it? It didn't break because it was in a cage, but the filament would bust. And the bulb would go out. And my dad used to come home and say, i got a rough surface bulb. I learned something. Rough surface bulbs are only so rough. Right? And they still break. We've got to realize in our own lives, the, the place where we burn out at, or is easiest to burn out at, is when we get shaken. You get that? When we get dropped, when we do something in our lives that maybe we shouldn't have done. And how many know drops are accidents? It means I I didn't sit there and just want to walk into this, but I walked into this place and I got shaken and now my light went out. So the first thing I've got to do, if my light's not burning, is I've got to look at my bulb and maybe ask God to change the bulb. And if the light doesn't come on in my life, I've got to sit there and say, God, I have an issue somewhere in my life because I don't have any power and I'm not touching any lives. And we could get into a whole list of that, but I don't want to get into that because we've talked about some of that already. But we're the light. And if the world doesn't have light, it gets dark. And when darkness takes place, how many know that the whole world starts changing? We were, again, doing outreach yesterday with my, my brother and his church, that church that he's at. And we sat there and we got into this, this, this housing development at 10 o'clock in the morning and we stood there. Why is that? People don't wake up at 10 o'clock in the morning anymore on Saturday mornings. When I was a kid, I don't know how you were, but when the sun came up, I was up. 
When the sun came up, I was on my bike. I was out knocking on my neighbor's doors. It didn't matter if you were a morning person or not a morning person. If you lived in the neighborhood that we lived in on Ruby Street, Joseph Street, or Amanda Street, we would wake you up because it was time to have fun. And we were going in the woods. We were going fishing. We were going swimming. We were going hiking. We were going on a bike hike. We were playing war. I know that's violent. Yes, we made guns out of sticks and everything else. But, you know... We, we did those things like that, and we played. Sometimes someone have a, 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 a net up. We played badminton until it turned into kill the person with a badminton thing and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Sometimes it was crab apples when they were in the ground, and they were grenades, and then you knew when you were hit in war. I mean, that was just our life. That's what we did. But in today's world, we're becoming people of the night. We're becoming people that are, are getting used to the dark. And we've got to realize something. That's not what God has called us to be. We're the light of the world. And if the world is getting dark, it's because the church is not doing its job. If the world is getting dark, it's because you and I are not shining like we should shine and being bright like we should be. So we've got to look at our lives and say, where is the power? So let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be here. We thank you for that opportunity, God, to be radically changed by you, Lord, to be the light of the world. Lord, you said don't hide it under a basket. Matter of fact, Lord, I know if I hide my light under a basket, it's going to burn the basket up. And God, I pray, Father, that your glory and your honor and your praise would move in my life, that they would experience you this morning. I thank you that they're here, God. I thank you that they walked into this building to participate with you. And God, I pray that you anoint me to speak the word of God plainly and clearly to them, God, and to help me speak your word. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. So as I began to look at this, I realized something, that this is the power of God. When Jesus died on the cross, it brought the power of God. But there's something more to it than that. How many people's lives would be different today if my life was different today? I keep asking myself that question, and I keep this slide in my messages just to remind myself that God has told me that I have to be a different person. You see, you can't follow Jesus and not change. I want you to get that. You can't follow Jesus in being the same miserable person you've always been. Jesus is all about transformation. That's why Bethany stood up here and said, what are we all about? Helping families and what? Changing lives. If lives don't get changed, we're just playing religion. If lives, I don't want to be a church that gets full just because everyone likes us. Because first off, I know you won't like me if you stay around me long enough. Because I'll annoy you in some way, somehow, and hopefully it's by the gospel. But, you know, we've got to realize something, that we're not here just to fuel building up. We're here to get people to follow Jesus so that they'll go out in the world and radically transform the world around us, that people will experience the power and presence of God, that when you lay hands on people, you'll pray for them and they'll feel the power of God surging out of you, that they'll feel something different, that the words you speak to you won't just be words of inspiration, but they'll be words of hope that will get into their heart that they'll play over and over that when they lay their head down on the pillow at night they'll remember the conversation they had why because it's an anointed called of God conversation that we'll realize that people that come into our lives aren't just people but they're divine appointments that God has allowed me to meet and allowed me to address and then given me the privilege to pour into that they would experience the freshness of water oh. The greatest example I can do is I remember when I was a little kid one time, we went to a store and I loved to swim as a kid and we swam in creeks. We never had swimming pools, so uh, it was really cool if you got goggles because the creeks that we did swim in were orange. And if you opened your eyes in them, it didn't go well. It burned your eyes. I remember getting goggles and I got a pair of goggles and it was winter time. And I remember sitting there and thinking, well, how can I play with my goggles? So I put my goggles on and I, I remember swimming under the covers. I don't know if you ever did that. Uh, yes, I had a sense of imagination. And I remember swimming under the covers, and I noticed after swimming for a while, Garrett, that the air got really stagnant. Has anyone else ever noticed that? Pull the covers over your head and try to hide because you're afraid, and you pull it over. It doesn't take too long until you breathe out all the oxygen, and you have to go to the surface and get a breath. And I remember going to the service and pulling it down and going, ah, that's fresh air. It didn't even matter if somebody passed gas around you. It was good air. 
And I remember sitting there, and I remember thinking about that and saying, God, this is like you, that that's what the world's like. They're, they're sitting there, and they're breathing that recycled air over and over again every day, and, and they're living through this sinful life, and they need you to be the one that pulls the covers off their head and say, breathe, it's the fresh air of the God. Breathe, it's the fresh air of the Holy Spirit. And you've got to just breathe in. That when they breathe in, they go, wow, I needed that. So that's why we need the power. You see, a lot of people in the church world think that in order to get people to love Jesus Christ, you've got to become like the world and be their friend. They don't want someone in the world to be their friend. They've already tried that. They need a light in a darkened world. They need oxygen that is pure and fresh. They need unpolluted air that, that will be inspiration to their hearts and inspiration to their soul. So as I went on, I went into 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse number 9. I want to read this to you. No one's ever seen or heard anything like this. He says, never so much as imagined anything quite like it. What God has arranged for those that love him. You see, there in 1 Corinthians, Paul's talking to the Corinthian church and he's saying, you've got something that no one else in the world has. God has given you the power of the Holy Spirit to radically change hearts and radically change lives that you can be a breath of fresh air into their hearts. Listen, I know that the devil is going to try to tell you you're not worthy. I know he's going to tell you that you have a past. I know he's going to tell you that you failed this week. I know he's going to tell you that you're not worthy. I know he's going to tell you that you're not good enough. I know he's going to tell you you're not pretty enough. I know he's going to tell you not in shape enough, not skinny enough, not fat enough, not whatever. But he's going to always tell you that. But you've got to realize that God said this. No one's ever seen or heard anything like this. And then he goes on and he says this. Things never discovered or heard of before. He said things beyond our ability to imagine. King James Version says no eye has seen and no ear has heard. The things nor entered into their heart the things that God has prepared for them. And this is another rendition. This is the Passion Translation. Things never discovered or heard before. Things beyond our ability to imagine. There are the many things God has in store for all his lovers. That's what God wants us to be. God wants us to be that lover of God that we have things that no one can imagine. That we stand there and when someone walks up to us and we don't know what to say. And I encourage you to do is say, God, give me the wisdom. And then all of a sudden you start talking to people. And you start saying things to them. And you see their, their face light up. Or maybe you see a tear in their eye. And they sit there and say, man, I just really needed that today. That's what we're all about. We're that hope in their world. A hope in their lives. And that's what God has called us for. There are three events that, that did something that radically changed the world. Three. Number one was Jesus coming out of the grave. You've got to get that. No, not on the cross. Lots of people were on the cross. Do you know that? In the Roman world, it was common to be crucified. That wasn't the significant act. It wasn't the significant act of saying, not my will, but thy will be done. That was powerful. It's not the, the words of Jesus saying, it is finished. That's powerful. But what the power was, he could have said it was finished, but if he would have never came out of the grave, it wouldn't have mattered it was finished. He would have been finished. The world-changing event that took place was Jesus coming out of the tomb. That was the first world-changing event. The second world-changing event was Jesus ascending into heaven. You see, nobody has ever done that before. All through the book, as you read the Old Testament, no one ever ascended to heaven. But Jesus did something that no one else has ever done before. He broke all natural laws. Did you get that? He broke all natural laws. He said, I don't care what the laws are. It matters who I serve and what I am. And he did something. Gravity had to let go. Isn't that awesome? When he went through space, it didn't kill him. How many know that if you get out of a spaceship and you're in outer space and you get out of that place, you will blow up like a nothing in a heartbeat because of the pressure and all the forces that are there and you're going to die instantly. But Jesus crossed that divide and he went into what the Bible calls the third heaven and that's where he sat down at the right hand of the Father and the Bible says that he ever lives to make intercession for you and I. Wow, that's powerful. But as he was going up through there, he was doing something. You see, there's a scripture, and we're going to get into it in a minute, that it says the powers, the devil is the prince and the power of the air now. And he got that because you and I, not you and I, but Adam and Eve sinned. And when they sinned, they gave away all the earth, air, that, 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 
what we breathe and that world in which we live and, and all that stuff. And Jesus penetrated through the darkness and penetrated through the devil's hold to go to the Father. And he said something, if I go away, I won't leave you comfortless. He said, I'm going to send you another comforter. And the next amazing thing that happened, it says, oh, I've got to get to Scripture first, sorry. It wasn't that long ago that you lived in the religion, customs, and values of this world, obeying the dark ruler of earthly realm who fills the atmosphere with his authority and works diligently in the hearts of all those who are disobedient to the truth of God in Ephesians 2 and 2. But something happened. When Jesus went through, he put a hole in the devil's kingdom. And when that hole was in the devil's kingdom, he said, I'm going to send you another comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of the living God. And the Holy Spirit, now, now that's an example of what they suppose a meteor strike would look like, but that's what happened to the devil's kingdom when the Holy Spirit came. He came in fire and he sat upon people. Where did it all start? It started in Jerusalem. It started with the crucifixion in Jerusalem. It started with the resurrection in Jerusalem. It started with what? The ascension out of the area of Jerusalem. And it started with the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the fulfillment of God's prophecy in Jerusalem. God said, I'm going to do it. And do you know to this day that Jerusalem is still the most contested city in the world? Why? It annoys darkness that that place still exists. It annoys the darkness that there's people that are still there. And he's done everything in their power to get them to not believe in the Messiah. And to this day, some of them are still looking for the Messiah, rejecting the Messiah that came. But God sent the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit came, things changed. Now, we've got to understand something. Realize he says, I'm going to send you what my Father has promised. But stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. I love that. Until you've been clothed with power. We need to be clothed in the power of God. We need to know the power of God. As I sat there and I went a little bit further on, I thought about it. How many ever did that in a bottle or a, a, a tub of water and you take a drip and you drip it down and you see all the rings go out? You see, when the Holy Spirit came down to earth in Acts chapter 2, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and it says, cloven tongues sat upon them, and they began to speak and prophesy all the amazing things that God did. It started a ripple effect that was going to go out and continues to go out. Every time the devil thinks it's almost calm and darkness thinks they've calmed it down, God just lets another drip down and does it again in your life. Every time that the evil thinks that he's got you and he's going to destroy you and he's going to overcome you, God just gives another drip down in your life. And there's another ripple that begins to happen. And he begins to stir the waters. Why? Because if you go back to the pool of Bethesda, it says that there was people that were there and sick. But it says an angel of the Lord came down and stirred the waters. And the first one in got healed. And God's saying, listen, I'm still the water stir. Just when the devil thinks everything's calmed down, I like to mess it up. Isn't that cool that God likes to mess it up? Yeah, we've got to realize that just about the time we think we've got God all figured out, God likes to mess it up. You see, the amazing part about being a child of God and being a Christian is God, He's so immense and He's so amazing and He's so wonderful and He's so glorious that you can never get to the end of it and you never get tired of it and you never get bored with it. Because about the time you get bored with it, He just lets another drop fall in your life and messes it all up. Now, you may be sitting here today saying, why isn't my life messed up, Pastor? You see, we've got to be willing to let him mess it up. If we keep saying no, he drips somewhere else. You see, we can't say no and call him Lord in the same breath. I always have to say, being he is my Lord, yes. When he says go, I must go. When he says run, I must run. When he says dive in, I must dive in. When he says jump, I've got to jump. I've got to do what God says or else I begin to limit the power of God moving in my life because no longer is he Lord, but I then become Lord. And God said, I will not share my glory with another person. So as I begin to look at this, I realize something. This sent shockwaves through the darkness. You see, just when they thought, and all it really would have taken was for someone to find Jesus' body. But you know what? You can't find him when it's gone. And we've got to realize that's what the power of the Holy Spirit does in all our life. Now, I want to take you on a journey through the power of the Holy Spirit this morning. Then Moses said to him, Lord, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. Moses is in the desert. He's in this place. He's in this situation, and he realized something. He realizes that he's with a bunch of slaves that have slave mentality. 
You know what slave mentality is? You're free, but you don't know you're free. You know, I look at an elephant. You know, when they train an elephant to be a tame elephant, they drive a stake in the ground when it's little, and they, they put a chain on it, and it can't get free. As it grows, it's more than strong enough to pull the stake out of the ground and walk away. But because its mind has been programmed that it can't get away, it never uses its true strength to get out. And it stays in that state of captivity even when it has the power to get out. You see, that's what evil likes to do with us. He likes to remind us of things that we tried to go through and things we tried to get free from. Maybe even before we were Christians or when we were baby Christians, we didn't understand the fullness of God and we try to get free. And he brings back, it's called your past. And he says, you can't do that because remember your family. You can't do that, remember all the guys or all the women you slept with. You can't do that, remember all the divorces you've been through. You can't do that, you've gone bankrupt before. You can't do that. And he begins to tell us all the things and they become chains that try to stop us from moving when we actually have the power of God to be radically different. But we get stuck in that situation because we're not willing to pull. He says this, he says, Lord... If you don't go with us, don't take us from here. Do you realize what he's actually saying? Let us die here. We're free, but let us just die here. Because we can't do this on our own. He says, don't send us up from here. He says, how will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? Man, that needs to be our prayer. How will anyone know, God, that that I've been with Jesus except you go with me? Except you touch my life. He says, what else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? Listen close to what I'm about to say. Us having a good worship team that sounds professional is not going to be any different. Matter of fact, it'll be worse than the people that are on the stages of the concerts. It's not about professionalism. Having good speakers is no different because the world is full of good speakers. We think if we had more money, if we just had more money, we could make it better. And we don't realize something that, you know what, we see people all around us with tons of money, but they don't make the world better, they make the world worse. So all those things aren't there. He says, what will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? It is your presence. God, if you come with us, no one can stand against us. And then I love it, in Exodus chapter 33, and it's... I want to take you this morning to the gifts of the Holy Spirit that God gives us. And the very next word, God says, I will go with you. And this is what Moses says. You ready? He says, then show me your glory. I don't want just your presence. I want your glory. You see what Jesus did when he rose from the grave and he ascended to the right hand of the Father and he ever lives to pray for you and I is he let the glory down on earth. You see, a lot of people are like, I can't wait to get to heaven, man. When I get to heaven, I just can't wait until we break through. And God's like, you already broke through. You already made it to the other side. You've already run the race. You've already done the things that you're supposed to do. You've already done all that stuff. It's time for you to do something. It's time for you to accept what God has given you and take what God's promises are. I heard someone yesterday saying something to me, and I had to remind them, and they're like, Maybe we could come down here and have a Bible study. And I said, people don't need Bible studies. I want you to understand this. We've had enough Bible studies. It's time to put an action to our Bible studies. It's time to do what we already know with what God has taught us. It's not time to sit there and study a little bit deeper. All over the Christian world, people are huddling up saying, let's just get a little bit deeper. I'm not ready yet. And God's saying, the day you got saved, you were ready. I love Paul when Paul got knocked off his high horse when he was riding down the road to Tarsus and God knocked him off and he said it's hard for you to kick him in the bricks. The very next thing you see Paul doing after he goes and finds the people that God tells him to do and people pray for him and he gets his sight back, the very next place you find him is teaching in the synagogue. What was he doing? He was giving out. What was he doing? He was telling what happened to his life. You see, what people need to hear from you is not the scriptures and more scriptures. People need to know how God changed your life. People need to hear how God transformed you. How he brought you from a state of fear to a state of hope. How he brought you from depression to joy. How he brought you in those situations. If you're not there, you need to break through. Because how can you sit there and lead someone else from depression if you're depressed? 
How can I lead someone else out of a state of fear if I'm afraid? There's a reason why God has let us be afraid of certain things, so that we have to overcome those fears. Think about that for a second. There's a reason God has let us end up in some of the situations we've ended up, so we have to break through those places. We just sit there and say, God, why don't you just move it out of the way? And God says, no, I want you to break through it. I want you to come through it so that you have a testimony and let other people know that they can break through it. Wouldn't it be awesome if everywhere you went to, that you'd be just like walking down the road like a video game and said, Alakazam, and a lightning bolt came down and it blew apart, and you're like, whoa, glory. That would be really cool, wouldn't it? You'd be like, man, I'm a Christian. I'm full of the power of God. But you know what? God doesn't do that. God lets us come to obstacles in our walk with him so that we can build our faith. That we can break through something. We do that by breaking through the, with the power of God through the gifts that God has given us. And by saying, God, show me your glory. God, I want to know your glory. I don't want to just come to church. I don't want to just sing songs. I don't want to just clap my hands. I don't want to just sit here. I don't want to have talents and abilities that I'm afraid to use. God, take the fear out of my life so that, God, I can be radically changed. I was talking to Garrett this week. Somebody's bagpipes are going off. Would you please get your bagpipes? <laughs> Yeah, you never know when the pipes are going to go off in the middle of the silence and it's all good. I was talking to Garrett this week and he said something to me and this will amaze you. He says, I used to think I was an introvert until God showed me differently. If you've hung around Garrett, you know he's not an introvert. He's outgoing and that's good. You see, God doesn't care about your personality. God overrides your personality through the power of the Holy Spirit. It was really cool. This the couple weeks ago, because I've been working on a roof for a while, so I don't remember the exact time. I was watching people do parkour. How many ever watch people do parkour? How many know what it is? They're like nuts. They like run across buildings and jump off of them and all this kind of stuff and, and jump on little posts out in the middle of the water and all this kind of stuff and run across them. And it started in France is where it started at. And they actually have pictures in, uh, I forget what it's called, the, the capital of uh, Britain. And they are actually running across the rooftops of the, of the places. Seriously, it is nuts. And I was watching that and I was like, man, God, that's amazing. And this is what the Holy Spirit spoke to me. He said, when you get your new body in heaven and you become back to earth on the, in that new state, he said, that is going to be normal to all of you. I was like, that's crazy. I, li I like watching the videos on YouTube, amazing people and some of the amazing things they do. And some of those people that do yoga and stuff, they like bring their legs all the way back over here and, you know, do things that I can't even imagine that I would break into a million paces. And God was like, you know, you, when I give you your new body, it's going to be different. And I was like, man, God, that's really cool. And I could get excited about that, but I've also got to get excited about what I am right now. God has made all of you in here fearfully and wonderfully made. He puts you together in your mother's wombs. It's just exactly like you wanted you to be. Instead of looking in the mirror and saying, I don't like myself, you need to start saying, thank God I am who I am. Thank God God changed my life. Thank God God has made me what I am. You see, that's what we do through the power of the Holy Spirit. And I've got to hurry. So the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit, I've talked about these before, but I want to reintroduce you to them. We're going to pick up on the gold ones next week. And this is what they are. He gave us the gift of tongues. What is that? And, and, you know, people sit there and say, now listen, <sighs> the church has tried to harm the kingdom of God, I think, at times, more than they've tried to help the kingdom of God. Because, you know, we, we get spiritual gifts, and then we think that we have to show them off, and we get in the flesh, and we drive people away from it. I want to tell you this. When God moves, it draws people to him. When flesh moves, it pushes people away from him. I just want you to get that. When God works, it's powerful. You might have been in a church one day and said, I saw some freaky stuff there. That wasn't God. Because when God shows up, you'll be like, whoa. Yeah. So there's tongues. There's interpretation of tongues. And I've gone through these. And there's prophecy. And that is my body. I have to have my body and my body to do those things. The next one says word of wisdom and word of knowledge and discerning of spirits. That takes my soul or my mind where God uses us because God wants to use all of us body, soul, and spirit, right? That's what God wants to use all of us with. Then the ones we're going to get into are healing and miracles and faith. And that takes my spiritual man. I can't do that on my own. 
I can't do a miracle without God. I can't see someone healed without God. I can't build supernatural faith without God. And we're going to get into start getting those next week. But we have these gifts that God gave us to make us testimonies of the glory of God. Not so that we can build ministries. Not so that we can have buildings. Not so that our name can be in the highlights of everywhere that we go. I came to really get on fire for God in the 80s. And I remember in the 80s, it bothered me. Because I remember all the people on TV were this, Jimmy Swigert Ministries, Kenneth Copeland Ministries, PTL Ministries. And I watched all these people and I thought, why did your name become the center? I want to teach you something. When you're in around a ministry and their name is first, run from it. Because you know what, this is not about Terry Jones, it's not about anyone else's name, it's about God. It's about building His kingdom. It's about living for Him. It's about walking with Him and talking with Him and believing in Him. And our name should never be in it because you know what, I'm only a servant of God. I'm just a nobody that God picked up and made as somebody through the blood of Jesus Christ. And if you take it all away, I'd still be a nobody. You see, it's God that does it. And we've got to watch ourselves as we walk with God and talk with God that we don't get proud. I remember going to a church as a kid, and we had a piano player with an attitude. You've probably never been in a church like that. But I remember this person, he's dead now, but I remember he came in and he used to really be into piano playing so much that he had to have his nails done. All right, this is the 80s, man. They didn't, guys didn't get their pedicures in the 80s, just to let you know. Manicures, whatever that one is, whatever's whichever end. I don't do that, so I don't know. But he used to come in with his nails all done up, and he used to have them long. And I remember even walking up to the, we had a grand piano in our church at the time, and you could see the, the nail scratch marks in the back of the piano from his nails hitting the piano as he played so marvelously. And he'd go over in the organ and he'd play. But I remember that, you know, at times he would come late, and you couldn't start church until he came. That's not what God's into. That's called my flesh thinks I'm something. God wants people who will just be humble before him and say, God, I'm a nothing. Just use me for what you want to use me for. Just touch me where you want me to be used of God. I would rather have the janitor of a church full of the Holy Spirit pray for me than a pastor who thinks he's something that has a big, long education that doesn't know God. You see, we've got to realize God wants to give you gifts and talents in your life, but you've got to be willing to open them, and you've got to be willing to use them. And when you get them, you've got to realize that they're from God, that they're a gift, that you don't own them. I remember here in this church at one time, there was a certain individual walked in and says, I'm a healer. I have the gift of healing. I did that same thing. I laughed. I said, really? Yes. I prayed for my wife once and she got healed. That's really awesome. I prayed for people that got healed, but I'm not a healer. He's the healer. You see, we've got to watch what we speak because life and death is in the power of our tongues and it gives away our heart. We've got to understand that when God blesses us with a gift and God does something amazing in our life, and if you begin to pursue God, God is going to do crazy amazing things in your life. God is going to do awesome things in our life. We've got to realize it's for His glory and for His honor and for His praise. So as I begin to sit there, I want to go on to another scripture that says this, For although we live in the natural realm, we do not wage a military campaign employing human weapons using manipulation to achieve our aims. I read that this morning. I thought, wow, God, have I seen people try to manipulate people into being moved for God? What's that look like? You're going to hell. You better get ready. You're going to die and go to hell. If I get someone saved through fear, as they call it, lives don't change. If I get people saved by love, life changes. Now listen, there's nothing wrong to say there is a heaven and there is a hell. I'm not saying we don't say that. But what I'm trying to say is we've got to make sure when we're ministering to people that we're ministering to them out of the love that is inside of us and the power of God that is inside of us. Do you remember the covers? Pull back the covers and let them experience God. That's what it's really all about. It's about getting that breath of God and feeling that, that fresh air and going, wow, that's really cool. 
That's really amazing. And experiencing God. He goes on and he says, instead our spiritual weapons are energized with divine power to effectively dismantle the defenses behind which people hide. How do we do that? How do we, how do we dismantle the defenses behind which people hide? Prayer. I want you to know that. Not everyone is going to accept what you have to say right off the bat. They're going to look at you sometimes and just say, you're crazy. And it's okay. Be crazy. It's okay. Be weird. You see, you don't know what God's doing with their life when they're laying down in bed. You don't know what God's doing in their life in those silent, still places when no one else is around. Our job is to plant the seed in their life and to give through the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives to pour into their lives and pour into their hearts and let them get a thought in their mind that is going to haunt them through the power of God. I've learned something. I could run away from my church. I could run away from my parents. I could run away from a lot of places, but I could never outrun the Holy Spirit. Everywhere I went, he was. My mom, I told you this when I was a kid, and I'd be running, going off with my best friend. My mom would say two words to me, be good. Seriously. You know how many times be good followed me everywhere I went? You know why be good followed me? Because she was praying for me. How do I know that? Because when I came home from school and when I was 18 years old in high school, I didn't come home to my mom watching soap operas. I came home to my mom reading her Bible and tears running down her face, and I knew what she was praying about. How do you know that? I could feel it. I remember times whenever I'd be sitting there, and I remember being at a party, and I, I never have been drunk, I've never been high, I've tasted alcohol, and it really does not appeal to me, and people say, you got to get a taste for it, you got to acquire a taste for it. I did not have to acquire a taste for Pepsi, Mountain Dew, and root beer, or McDonald's french fries. <laughs> First time when I was a kid, and someone gave me the Golden Arch french fries, I was hooked, just to let you know. But I remember one day I was at a party and I was there and I was like trying to get into it and trying to be popular and I was getting more popular and I remember I was like having fun, I was having a good time. You'll never guess who ruined the Holy Spirit. He's like, what are you doing here? Talk about rain on your perfectly good party. Conviction. And I looked over at my best friend, he was also a Christian in my youth group with me and we were both there trying to run away from all that stuff and he looked at me and he said, are you ready to go? I said, yep. He says, me too. Why? Because it was getting him too, because someone was praying for him. I'm giving some of your parents, I want you to get this, pray for them. They can ignore your words, but they can't ignore your prayers. Just to let you know, I'm a victim of it. Where somebody prayed for me. You see, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man, it avails much. I've got to move on. He goes on and he says this, and I'm in closing. He says, we can demolish every deceptive fantasy that opposes God and break through every arrogant attitude that is raised up in defiance of the true knowledge of God. Listen, I know there's some of who believe with all your heart that people cheated in an election and Trump should have won. That's okay. And if it's true, I'll tell you what you need to do. Pray and say, Lord, let the truth become out and let that which is in secret be shouted upon the housetops. And it will. But you see, the answer is not that. He says... This thing that breaks through deceptive fantasies and breaks through arrogant attitudes is God's power. That's what we've got to get. You see, we don't need to protest. We need to pray. We don't need to protest. We need to live for God and say, I'm going to be a light. I'm going to let people know one person at a time that God's real and it's wrong to do certain things. Somebody say yes. Someone's going to get offended. Here comes the offensive warning. I'm closing. I don't need to sit there and yell at people who are having abortion and tell them it's wrong. I need to pray for them that their heart tells them it's wrong. Why is it wrong? I'll tell you very simply. God said, thou shalt not kill. That's really simple. I don't need to sit here and stand at a bar and say, what you're doing is wrong. I need to be a light and let them realize that there's a new wine. Everyone hear that? The Bible says, be not drunk with wine but be filled with the Spirit. Why did he say that? Because being in the Holy Spirit is like being drunk. We get happy. We get glad. We don't care when things go wrong. We laugh at things that used to make us mad. We become intoxicated all the time when we're just going through life and the devil slaps us and we go, <laughs> I 
That's why he said be filled with the Holy Spirit. But you see, when we don't believe in that kind of stuff, we sit there and the devil slaps us and we sit there and get all mad and angry and sit there and get all afraid and wonder what's going on. But when you're drunk, you sit there and say, it's all good, God's got this. And we've got to realize God got this. He goes on and he says this, we capture like prisoners of war every thought and insist that it bow in obedience to the anointed one. We grab our thoughts and we destroy them. All of us have to do that. You see, the Holy Spirit comes upon me to help me get my mind under control. And if your mind's out of control, you need the Holy Spirit to give you some oil. How many know squeaky wheels get the grease? You see, when your mind's running like that, you just need to put some oil on it. And oil that baby down and say, we don't think that way anymore. We don't act that way anymore. We don't stand that way anymore. That's why the Holy Spirit's come. So as we begin to get in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, they're not there to be afraid of. They're not there for those kind of things. They're there, and he goes on, and he says this. He says, since we are armed with such dynamic weaponry, he says, we stand ready to punish any trace of rebellion as soon as you choose complete obedience. Oh, there's the key. I have to choose complete obedience. What's that mean? You go where you don't want to go. You live like you don't want to live. You do what you don't want to do. I've told you this story, but I'm going to tell it to you one more time. I remember sitting down in, when I left my last church, and I said, God, I will go anywhere in western Pennsylvania but Apollo. That is not a lie. That is a true story. And where am I? Apollo. You think God doesn't have a sense of humor? You see, I was limiting God, and God said, did it ever dawn in you that the reason you don't want to go there is because that's where I want you to go, and the devil is trying to talk you out of it? You see, we've got to realize to be where God wants us to be is the greatest place to be all the time. So you may not understand all there is about the Holy Spirit. As we go through this, you won't understand all there is about him because he's God. You may not, and, but our biggest mistakes are what? Not believing because it does not make sense to my natural mind. We're going to talk about some crazy supernatural things. I'm going to tell you stories that I've seen in my life where I've saw God move in my heart, where I've seen God move in other people's lives, where I've seen God do these kind of things. Not wanting him as we have seen the abuses or counterfeits. You see, some of you have been in a religion where you've experienced things that they told you was the Holy Spirit, but it was nothing more than a manifestation of somebody's flesh. And it turns you off. And you sit there and say, I don't want any part of that. I've been in churches where they, all they did is try to walk around talking in tongues. Paul said they're mad. He said, I'd rather speak ten words in a known tongue than a million words in an unknown tongue. He said, I don't want y'all being like that. He says, if someone comes in, they're going to think you're crazy. You see, we've abused what God has given us, and we've turned things and turned people off because we didn't use the gifts of God for what the gifts of God are for. We want to be different than that. I remember there's a prominent preacher on TV, but I won't tell you his name, but I remember that he sat there and said that his, his grandfather actually led four people in West Virginia to Jesus Christ where he spoke German four times and he never knew German. That's God. Can you imagine walking up to someone and his grandson said to him, he said, you were speaking some foreign language. He said, no, I wasn't. I was speaking English. The guy never even knew what he was doing. That's God. How cool is that? That's a miracle working God because who made man's tongue? God. You see, some of you might have done it. You might have never even known you've done what you've done because you're hearing the conversation and what you understand. And you're just being what God wants you to be. Don't worry about all the details. Just live for Jesus Christ and let God use you and don't get caught up in these things. Would you stand with me this morning? Now, I built a foundation one more time for the moving of the Holy Spirit. The greatest thing that God has given the church is the power of the Holy Spirit. I will say this a thousand times. I think my favorite group growing up as a kid, and I'm going to date myself, was Boston. I don't know about you, but if you're of that age or ever listened to Boston, I liked Boston. Maybe because they said, don't look back. I don't know. But I remember listening to them. To this day, I would rather have an anointed worship team than those professional musicians. You see, it's not about professionalism, it's about anointing. Now, I want to stop you there and think for a second. 
Now, that doesn't mean God's not going to teach you how to be a professional at something that you do through the power of the Holy Spirit so that you can minister to other people. We've always got to ask ourselves this question, who am I trying to glorify right here? Who am I trying to build up right here? I remember whenever our church just started growing and I was a pastor and I was frustrated. If You wouldn't understand that, but I was frustrated. Now, I remember driving down, I was driving down 66 towards Greensburg. And I was driving, I was like, God, how come the church never grew? In all these years I've been preaching, it never grew. And this is what the Holy Spirit said to me. You ready for this? It was a divine moment. You never said anything worthwhile. That was convicting. He's like, you finally listened to me and you're saying what I have to say instead of what you wanted to say or what your church wanted to say. That made me really stop and think. And I was like, God, don't ever again let me be that way. Church, when we start being used like God wants to be used, God is going to produce fruit in your life. I want you to know that. He told you, don't think about what you're going to say. He said, bathe yourself in the word of God and bathe yourself in prayer. And he said, I'll be the voice in your lips. When you're walking through the store and you get this thought, go pray for somebody, go pray for somebody. Somebody's like, I've never seen God do a miracle in my life. That's because you didn't listen to the voice. And you're driving down the road and there's a hitchhiker and he says, go pick them up. Turn around and go pick them up. But God, you don't understand, I'm going to be late. You're missing the miracle. It's going to be okay. Whenever God sits there and says, give them $20 or, or pay for their food or do whatever, do it for the glory of God. But don't sit there and say what the world says, just pay it forward. Say, God told me to bless you today because he loves you. When you start doing what God's telling you to do, God is going to radically change your walk with him. When you start doing what you want to do, your walk is going to get stale, boring, and lifeless. Listen to the voice of God. He's always talking. You say, I don't hear him. Get on the right channel. How? We're going to talk about that. And we're going to get into it deeper and deeper. Jesus loves you and he thinks you're amazing. He has a crazy, amazing plan for every life in here. If you're an introvert, he'll change you to an extrovert. If you're an extrovert, he'll change you to an anointed extrovert. Why? Because God doesn't want introverts. How many of you would want to go to court and have a silent witness? You're there, they saw the murderer, and you're being tried for murder, and you're sitting there going, I'm going to be tried for murder, and they bring the guy to the stand, and he's like, what do you have to say? You saw it, didn't you? Tell us what happened. I'd kill him. I'd be guilty of murder for once if I was innocent before. How many know when you're in court, you need someone to testify for you? You see, God doesn't want you to be silent. That's why he wants to change you into a life-giving person that is living, breathing, full of the Holy Spirit. He wants you to be oozing out with his presence. And that happens through walking in the Holy Spirit. It's not about church. We just come in here to get fired up and route on and say, go get him. You know, like we're in the locker room and we're in the second half, we're losing. We're Coach gets in there and says, you can play better than this. And he inspires you and you run out there and you take somebody's head off. That's what God wants to do. That's what church is really all about. And the cool part is, is you're allowed to take the devil's head off. You're allowed to kick him in the crotch. You're allowed to bite him. You're allowed to scratch him. You're allowed to do anything you want to do because he's evil. But God has given you the light of the world to be that light. Blind him with your light. Jesus loves you. Thinks you're amazing. Father, I pray for these people. God, as I went through this part, Lord, I pray they'll understand that, Lord, they are anointed and called of you. That, God, you have not called them to be silent, but you have called them to be a light. If their light's off today, God, and the circuit breaker blows, just anoint their lives and go through their lives and point to the problem in their life. Let your glory and your power and your anointing just flow supernaturally in them that they would know you and be blessed. And God will give you all the glory, all the praise, and all the honor. And everyone said, amen. Glory to God. As they sing, I thank God when they get done with it. Shake hands, rejoice in the Lord, because Jesus loves you and he thinks you're amazing.
Make sure they hear you. Hail, Lost, and now. 